schizophrenia and uh, other psychosis. Yeah, Vincent Van Gogh, uh, obviously a very famous painter. Um, they say that he was very depressed, but it probably was schizophrenia too. And uh, he very famously, during a bout of depression, cut off his ears once. Probably negative symptoms of schizophrenia, about which we will discuss later on, but they say that he was depressed. He's a very famous uh, mathematician in real life, this person, Nash, and uh, uh, he also had schizophrenia. So just to highlight the fact that uh, one may be schizophrenic and uh, yet at the same time be very brilliant or creative. So I'm uh, showing you both the sides of the coin, creativity as well as in uh, scientific intelligence. Van Gogh was creative, Nash was uh, scientifically brilliant, mathematically. So one can have the illness and still be quite brilliant. And uh, it's not that uh, having schizophrenia is the end of the life and you'll be unproductive throughout your life. It doesn't work like that. Okay, so what are we going to discuss today? A little bit of history of schizophrenia, epidemiology, etiology, clinical features, classification, diagnosis, management, obviously which includes uh, investigations and treatment, and a bit about other kind of psychotic disorders. Please remember that uh, psychotic disorders, they are, they are the umbrella terminology, psychosis and under that you have schizophrenia and uh, delusional disorder and all the other types of psychotic disorders. I hope you remember uh, our classification of uh, psychiatric conditions into neurosis and psychosis. So today we are talking about psychosis which are chronic and enduring as well as uh, very severe and disabling and the insight is lost during the course of the illness. Schizophrenia. Uh, these are the early pioneers of the subject. Unitary psychosis, that's what the scientist Carl Grisinger in 1870, um, second half of uh, 19th century, uh, talked about. Then it was uh, Kraepelin who actually described the schizophrenia as a type of dementia which really, if you think about it, it is. Uh, it has some of the features of uh, dementia, such as uh, cognitive disturbances. And that was in the late 19th century. Bloiler uh, gave the four A's of uh, schizophrenia, ambivalence, affective incongruity, loosening of associations and autism. Ambivalence, if you remember uh, from our lecture, uh, uh, in uh, psychopathology, you will remember that it is a bit of both, that is doing and not doing, going to and fro between uh, doing and not doing, being uncertain about whether to do or not. Affective incongruity is um, incongruous to the situation, that is laughing at the funeral is the usual example that I give. Loosening of associations, which is a type of uh, formal thought disorder, wherein uh, the association between two thoughts is lost or loosened at least. Autism is not the condition uh, autism that we normally see, uh, usually see in children, but it is um, being self-absorbed and uh, not interacting a lot. So today we call that the negative symptoms of uh, schizophrenia. But uh, if you look at the list of uh, four A symptoms by Bloiler, most of them still hold good, actually. We've added a few more criteria to these, but uh, most of them are still relevant. Incidents, uh, 15 to 20 per lakh per year. And uh, the prevalence rate across the world is pretty standard. Roughly, it is about 1%. Increased prevalence in uh, certain geographical areas and certain communities uh, such as in South India, especially Tamil Nadu and uh, 
lower socioeconomic uh, classes. Median age of onset is slightly earlier in men than in women. So 28 for men, 32 for women. Whereas the sex ratio is uh, equal, please remember that. Uh, even though the age of onset is uh, earlier in men, sex incidence is equal. Okay, if you remember correctly, we discussed that uh, anxiety disorders per se are uh, more common among women. Drug uh, dependence is more common among men. But that's not the case with schizophrenia. It's equal. Okay, remember that schizophrenia is a very complex condition and uh, therefore there is no one single causative factor that has been identified. So we go with uh, many theories to explain why schizophrenia happens in certain individuals. And one of the main theories is genetic theory. Now this is a very important uh, table which uh, clearly shows that schizophrenia has a familial tendency. So in uh, twin, uh, twin studies uh, involving monozygotic and dizygotic twins, as you can see, the concordance rates are very, very high among monozygotic twins. 48% is to 4%. So that's 12 times more chance of developing uh, schizophrenia if one of the twins has got the condition. If it is a monozygotic twin. So remember that monozygotic twins share the genetic material. So this uh, clearly shows that um, when compared with dizygotic, the, because of the sharing of the genetic material, schizophrenia occurs much more frequently in monozygotic twins. And the table is very important as well. Um, as the closeness of the relationship with the person with schizophrenia increases, the chances of developing the condition also increases. So 5% chance. So if a patient has a brother, the brother has 10% chance of developing schizophrenia. On the other hand, if uh, one of the parents is affected, there is a 14% chance in the offspring developing the condition. But if both the parents are affected, the risk increases to 46%, which is very, very high, nearly 1 in uh, 2. We are talking about lifetime risks here, that's what we are saying. Um, See, so remember that I told you in the previous slide, the general population risk across the world is 1%. So if you compare that with this, uh, about a family having schizophrenia, the risk is fivefold increase if you are a parent. The brothers and sisters is 10, per, 10 times more. If one parent is affected, 14% more. Both the parents, 46% almost like an exponential increase if both the parents are affected and then they go on to have children. So this table helps you understand the strong genetic element that is present in schizophrenia. As I told you there are multiple theories. The other theory is neurochemical theory uh, which we talk about when we talk about uh, medications that are used in the treatment of uh, schizophrenia which is antipsychotics and this is the reason for using antipsychotics. There is dopaminergic overactivity, especially in mesolimbic pathway and uh, that is increased in um, also in caudate and nucleus accumbens areas. So hyper dopamine activity, which is why we use antipsychotics, which reduce dopaminergic activity. Whereas there is also some serotonergic activity going on. Um, and how do we know that? It's because serotonin agonists uh, such as LSD, which is a street drug, can induce psychosis. And the reason for that is this, 5-HT agonism. Whereas, on the other hand, 5-HT2 antagonism can treat psychosis. And the best example for that is clozapine, which we discussed is uh, an atypical antipsychotic, which is used in treatment resistant 
schizophrenia. Generally, there is reduced inhibitory activity and increased excitatory activity going on because gamma amino butyric acid, remember, it is a inhibitory neurotransmitter. You understand? So that is reduced. On the other hand, glutamic acid is an excitatory neurotransmitter. If you remember your uh, studies in biochemistry, so that is increased in the brain of schizophrenic individuals. So they seem to be stimulated always. So this is just to highlight what I was telling you about the chemicals uh, that are increased. These are the uh, important pathways that are involved in uh, schizophrenia. A is uh, substantia nigra and uh, ventral tegmental area, amygdala, tuberoinfundibular system, nucleus accumbens, striatum, caudate nucleus, frontal cortex. So frontotemporal area mainly is what is involved in the uh, pathophysiology of schizophrenia, especially to do with the dopaminergic pathways. Let's move on to another theory now, which is neuropathological theory. So people went about uh, collecting the brains and sometimes they did autopsies on uh, schizophrenic patients who passed away. But later on when technology developed, they started doing neuroimaging, such as CT scan and MRI scans. And this is what they found. So ventricular enlargement and reduction in brain weight. Brain parenchyma is reduced. That is the reason for ventricular enlargement. As you can see in the picture on the left, this is the size of the ventricle in the person with schizophrenia, which is very enlarged compared to the healthy brain. And that's because there is neuronal loss which leads to parenchymal thinning. Frontal and temporal lobes are the major sites for abnormalities. And uh, even among them, left is more involved than the right side and the, there is also reduced hippocampal area. Remember that the hippocampus uh, is involved in higher mental functions such as memory. So all those areas are involved. So this is again an illustration of the same thing, enlarged ventricles, abnormalities of uh, white matter, then uh, reduced hippocampal volume, blunted temporal horns of internal ventricles, reduced brain volume as I told you, viral abnormalities, there is deepening of those and cortical cellular displacement. So these are all the brain pathological changes seen in the case of schizophrenia. Clinical features of uh, schizophrenia, I have just put uh, these features randomly. Uh, delusions which we discussed are fixed false beliefs in spite of evidence to the contrary. And hedonia is uh, losing interest in previously enjoyed activities, hallucinations, seeing or hearing things which are not there. Apathy is uh, the general disinterest or lethargy uh, in doing anything. Thought interference, feeling as though their thoughts are being interfered with, either put in or removed from the head. Evolution, lack of voluntary activities basically, no, no motivation to do anything. Incongruous effect which we discussed is uh, not in keeping with the um, scenario presented. The effect changes contrary to what is expected for that situation. Elogia is reduced uh, speech. Affective blunting is flattening of the effect, that's what uh, it means which is also seen in uh, depression and energy or loss of energy. Now out of these, some are called positive symptoms of schizophrenia and some are called negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Positive are what you elicit or recognize during mental state examination, whereas negative symptoms are those which uh, you observe in the patient, which he or she is not doing such as he or she is not interacting, such as he or, he or she is not talking much. So those are negative symptoms which are uh, 
fairly similar to what happens in a depression where the patient loses interest in all activities, is not talking a lot, those sort of things. So out of this, this list, I'll give you a clue. All the things which begin with the A, they are all negative symptoms. Anhedonia, apathy, evolution, elogia, affective blunting and energia or negative symptoms of uh, schizophrenia. Delusions, hallucinations, thought interference, incongruous affect, positive symptoms of schizophrenia. So classification of schizophrenia. Paranoid schizophrenia is the commonest type of schizophrenia and it is characterized by predominantly positive symptoms such as delusions and hallucinations. Catatonic schizophrenia includes posturing, rigidity and stupor. You remember uh, our psychopathology lecture in which we talked about all the catatonic signs and symptoms such as Mitjahan, Mitmakan, rigidity, tremors, posturing, stupor, uh, MB, tendency, negativism, you remember? All of these things will be present in catatonic schizophrenia. Abaphrenic schizophrenia has more of affective changes. That means the mood can change quite significantly. They are prone to irresponsible behavior. And the speech is very incoherent. It is very difficult to understand what they are trying to say. And that is because of the formal thought disorder. If you remember correctly, it is disorder of thought form where there is very poor connection between one thought to another. Therefore, that is reflected in the speech as well, which can be very incomprehensible. There is also simple schizophrenia, which is a bit of a misnomer because actually it is very complicated and uh, very difficult to treat. And it is characterized by aimlessness, being self-absorbed and a lot of negative symptoms, that is anhedonia, angelogia, evolution, a -ener a energia and all those things. So these are the four main categories of schizophrenia. Paranoid, catatonic, hebephrenic and simple schizophrenia. How do we make the diagnosis? And this is where we uh, have to talk about criteria for making diagnosis. Long before ICD-10 and DSM-5, the person in the picture there um, Schneider gave his first rank and second rank symptoms. First rank symptoms he said are more important to make a diagnosis of schizophrenia and he gave these criteria. So thought withdrawal, insertion and broadcasting. Thought withdrawal means the patient feels as though his thoughts are being withdrawn from his brain, removed from the brain. Whereas insertion is the opposite. He feels that new thoughts are being inserted into the brain. Broadcasting is, he feels as though the removed thoughts are being broadcasted to the world. Either through paper or television, internet, wherever. He feels that everybody is coming to know because somebody is broadcasting his thoughts like a news broadcast. You understand? Then he talked about passivity phenomena. Passivity relates to uh, not being in control of one's own thoughts and actions. Uh, especially to do with physical activities. The patient feels as though his uh, body is being controlled by some external agent. It appears as though he has become very robotic and uh, he's being influenced through remote control and his actions are being controlled. So the patient may feel both the thoughts as well as the actions are being controlled by somebody else. So that is passivity phenomena. He or she feels that his body has become passive. That's what it means. Then there are the important auditory hallucinations. And the three important types under that are thought echo, wherein the patient hears his own thought being retold as an echo in his mind. Okay. And then there is third person hallucinations which means uh, the person, when we say person, first person, second person, third person, it is the patient that we are talking about. The patient is the person. If the patient is the third person, 
that means there are two voices talking about the patient so first person is the voice auditory hallucination second person is also another voice another auditory hallucination both those voices are talking about the patient who is the third person here so that's what it means look at him how silly he looks usually these voices are derogatory by nature so they might be passing some negative comments about the patient with each other and the patient is constantly hearing that these two voices discussing about the him in very negative terms so that is third third person auditory hallucinations then there can also be running commentary as in a cricket match or a football match wherein the commentators are continually describing the action that is happening in the middle the voices are continually describing what the patient is doing so if he sits down the voices says look he is sitting down if he starts walking they'll say he is walking now so that is a running commentary so all these schneider said are very important types of auditory hallucinations and he classed them as being first rank symptoms to make a diagnosis of schizophrenia delusional perception wherein the perception is normal but the importance or the explanation attached to the perception is totally delusional for example i saw the traffic lights turning green and i knew immediately that the aliens have landed and they are coming to take me seeing the traffic lights turning green is normal visual perception but the significance attached to that perception is totally delusional aliens landing coming to take me that is a delusional interpretation of normal perception so that is delusional perception thought withdrawal insertion broadcasting passivity phenomena auditory hallucinations of three types thought echo third person and running commentary and delusional perception any one of them clear cut for a few weeks to months enough to make a diagnosis of schizophrenia which is why going back to why highly intelligent people and creative people who otherwise seem to be okay can also have schizophrenia just so having thought broadcasting for example clear cut is enough to make a diagnosis of schizophrenia they may be okay in other uh, faculties we understand so these are the first rank symptoms of schneider even though they are very old they are still very relevant because many of these criteria will overlap as you will see with icd10 and dsm5 criteria so they are still relevant for your uh, as far as you are concerned for the exams so you need to know these criteria as well as at least one of icd10 and dsm5 criteria so what does the icd10 say as far as the criteria are concerned so at least one of the following should be present for at least one month that is thought withdrawal insertion broadcasting or echo same as first rank symptoms of uh, schneider but except that echo has gone up to the thought interference phenomena instead of being under auditory hallucinations you understand then passivity delusions passivity pertaining to mind or body being controlled by external agencies that is what it is auditory hallucinations running commentary or third person which is the same as the schneider's criteria except the thought echo has been put under thought interference phenomena and delusions of any other kind so what is missing here is delusional perception it is delusions of other kind so if these are less clear then the icd10 suggests that at least two of the following should be present for one month that is hallucinations in other modalities so the primary criteria it was auditory hallucinations so if those are less clear it could be hallucinations in other perceptual modalities such as seeing things which are not there which is visual hallucinations or tactile or olfactory or gustatory after auditory hallucinations probably the second most common type of hallucinations are visual hallucinations formal thought disorder as we discussed is disorder disorder of thought form wherein the associations between two, two thought processes is poor 
and sometimes very difficult to comprehend. Then there can be catatonic signs and symptoms such as maintaining abnormal postures for a long period of time. And as we discussed earlier, negative symptoms that is elogia, energia, evolution, anhedonia and all those things. Any of these two have to be present in a clear cut way for you to make a diagnosis for at least one month. So one of primary or at least two of the secondary type of criteria for ICD-10 diagnosis. Let's move on to DSM-5. At least two of the five symptoms must be present for at least one month. One of the two symptoms must be delusions, hallucinations or disorganized speech. So, it's called broad criteria these. There should be delusions. There should also be hallucinations. Disorganized speech, that is frequent derailment or incoherence, which is nothing but formal thought disorder. Grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior, that is hebephrenic type of behavior. Remember we said that in that type of schizophrenia, there is very disorganized thought and behavior, bizarre behavior or catatonic type of behavior such as abnormalities in postures and negative symptoms, elogia, evolution and all those things. So what does it say again? Two of these five broad symptoms should be present for at least one month. So it's quite broad these criteria DSM-5 as opposed to very very specific criteria given by both uh, Schneider and ICD-10. First rank symptoms of Schneider and any one of these two criteria should be on your fingertips as far as the exams are concerned. So management as we keep on telling you biopsychosocial uh, model, uh, investigations and treatment, um, investigations in the case of schizophrenia might involve urinary drug screen that is poly drug screen because drug induced schizophrenia can also happen. Uh, especially to do with uh, cannabis or any of the psychogenic uh, substances such as LSD or amphetamines. And then baseline uh, blood investigations you can do such as liver function tests because you will be giving quite a lot of medications, renal function tests, ECG because antipsychotics can prolong QTC interval remember. If you are suspecting some organic pathology, then you have to rule that out by doing appropriate investigations, which may also involve an MRI scan of the brain. Okay. Rating scales are available, positive and the negative symptom scale of schizophrenia, PAN-SS, that is the rating scale for schizophrenia. So you can do a baseline reading, give the treatment and then uh, do another reading and compare the two readings to see whether the condition is improving. And the baseline reading depending on the score will also give you an indication of how severe the condition is. Social investigations may involve you taking a further history, having an assessment done in terms of uh, the housing, finances job skills and all those kind of things. Treatment, mainstay of treatment for schizophrenia is antipsychotic medications. Usually we begin with atypical antipsychotic uh, medications or newer antipsychotic medications such as risperidone or olanzapine. In acute phases of the illness where the behavioral disturbance is severe, we can also make use of older antipsychotic medications such as haloperidol because it can be given in various modes such as oral, IM as well as IV. So that way haloperidol is very versatile because it can be given in many routes of administration. May have to be combined with benzodiazepine at, at least initially to control the behavior but again as I keep telling you benzodiazepine is not recommended as long term therapy. Long term therapy should be with antipsychotic medication. And also, one more aspect to biological treatment is depot antipsychotic injections. Sometimes, due to whatever reason, the patient may not want to take tablets on a long term basis. 
Sometimes it could be because of loss of insight also, the patient refuses to take the tablet. Then you can provide the option of giving depot antipsychotic injections, which will eliminate the need for taking daily tablets. So the patient can come once in two weeks or four weeks or six weeks, take the injection, which will last for that uh, duration and go back home. Or if he or she is in the community, the nurse can visit him there and give the injection at home and come back. So haloperidol can be a depot antipsychotic injection. Risperidol is also a depot antipsychotic injection. Pipotiazine is another one. Zuclopenthixol is another one. Flufenazine is another one. Flupentixol is other depot antipsychotic injection. Usually these are the ones that are used. In clinical practice we use quite a lot of Flufenazine and Flupentixol as depot antipsychotic injections. Psychologically there may be group therapies that the patient can attempt such as hearing voices group, insight development group it could be because insight is also lost because this is a psychotic condition. You can psychoeducate the family, very important to psychoeducate the family because they have no idea about the illness and it is up to you to make them understand what happens to the patient in this illness, how the family should manage the situation, how they should ensure that the patient complies with the treatment, especially when there is loss of insight. Can the patient get married? Can the patient uh, go for a job? All these things you will have to explain to the family. Social treatment would involve things like uh, looking at the job situation for the patient, housing, finances, because management of schizophrenia has moved out into the community, remember. No longer are patients with uh, schizophrenia institutionalized as they used to be in the past. There are no mental asylums. It's all about community integration. That's why we have community mental health teams who will be able to visit patients with schizophrenia, either a community nurse or mental health social worker to make sure that they are okay. There are certain good prognostic indicators as far as uh, schizophrenia is concerned. So let's talk a little bit about this. One is having paranoid schizophrenia. Paranoid schizophrenia comparatively carries a better prognosis than any of the other types, such as especially hemophrenic and simple schizophrenia. And the reason for that is, as we discussed earlier, paranoid schizophrenia has more positive symptoms, that is delusions and hallucinations. Whereas simple schizophrenia has more negative symptoms, such as evolution and all those things. So wherever there are more positive symptoms, generally the prognosis is better. Wherever there are more negative symptoms, prognosis is worse. Having the illness very early in life, usually the illness comes on in the second to third decade. You know, late teenagers, early twenties, like that. If a person develops illness very, very early, that means the brain damage is also happening from a very early age. Therefore, the prognosis is worse in the long run. Poor social support, poor family support, losing a job, being jobless, being homeless, financial loss, all these indicate poor prognosis in a case of schizophrenia. If it is drug-induced psychosis, it's probably better prognosis because if you take away the drug, the psychosis will also get better. But if a person who has already got schizophrenia later on goes on to abuse uh, drugs and continues to abuse drugs, then that carries a poor prognosis. Because in addition to having schizophrenia, the person is also abusing substances which can worsen the condition. Then there is something called high expressed emotions, which is the patient's family and the patient constantly bicker with each other. The family victimizes the patient by blaming him or her 
comparing him or her with uh, his or her sibling, for example, saying that all the bad things are happening because of the patient. Why did the patient have to develop such a horrible condition? You brought stigma to the family. Stigma is a huge issue in uh, psychiatry. So these sort of highly negative comments be and also not just negative comments, being over involved in the patient's affairs, trying to control everything that the patient does, hyper monitoring what the patient is trying to do. All these things will lead to high expressed emotions and uh, the patient will end up having a relapse. Even though the patient uh, may be in remission, if there is high expressed emotion from the family, there can be a chance of relapse. Therefore, the prognosis becomes very poor. So we we'll move on to the other type of uh, psychotic disorders. Schizoaffective disorder, which we discussed under mood disorders also. Basically in this, People with this illness have symptoms of both schizophrenia and the mood disorder, such as depression or bipolar disorder. So if a patient has got both psychotic symptoms as well as depression or manic symptoms, you can further divide this as schizodepressive disorder or schizomanic disorder, depending on what kind of mood uh, symptoms are present. So they are indiscernible, you can't separate them out. They are happening in the same person at the same time during the same period. So that is why they are clubbed together and called schizoaffective disorder. The other condition is schizophreniform disorder wherein the people have symptoms of schizophrenia but the symptoms last between one to six months. They are less severe and the duration of uh, the symptoms is also less. So it's not exactly like schizophrenia but appears to be like that. And then somebody could have brief psychotic disorder wherein there are short sudden spells of psychotic behavior often in response to a very stressful event such as a death in the family. Recovery is often quick, usually less than a month. So this could be like a bereavement reaction that has gone wrong, for example. Delusional disorder as we have discussed, it is only the delusion is present without any other psychotic symptom such as there are no hallucinations, there are no thought interference phenomena, it is only the delusion. So from fix it false belief involving some real, real life uh, situation that could be true such as being followed, being conspired against or having a disease, these delusions persist for more than one month. It is all exaggerated, okay, it may or may not be true but the importance of a, attached to the belief is delusional in, in its intensity and accordingly as I told you there are named delusional disorders such as erotomania which is also called de Clerambault's syndrome, Othello syndrome, Cotard's syndrome, Capgras syndrome, Fregoli syndrome. So there can also be shared psychotic disorder which is also known as polio do wherein one person is psychotic and they live in such a close relationship with another person that the other person also develops psychosis over a period of time. Happens in very close dependent relationships. Substance induced psychotic disorder caused by use or withdrawal of substances such as hallucinogens and crack cocaine and may cause hallucinations, delusions, thought disorder, Rule out organic conditions, number one. And secondly, rule out substance induced conditions because these substances can also cause psychosis. Cannabis, cacrocaine, and hallucinogens such as LST, magic mushrooms, amphetamines, and all those things. Then psychosis caused due to some kind of medical condition. Hallucinations, delusions, or other symptoms may be the result of another illness that affects brain function such as head injury or brain tumor, it could be a frontal lobe tumor or a temporal lobe tumor. So this is what we mean by organic conditions causing psychosis. Paraphrenia is a condition with similar symptoms as in schizophrenia that starts very late in life and occurs in the elderly population. 
It is not officially recognized as a formal diagnosis in the current classificatory systems of mental illness and is usually described as an atypical form of psychosis. Sometimes it's, we also call, call it late life psychosis or late onset psychosis. Some features overlap with schizophrenia but not considered to be a typical form of schizophrenia and happens almost exclusively in the elderly population. Okay. Right. I've got some MCQs it seems for you. True or false? 